And so just to go over some brief terminology, uh, recall that a nucleosome consists of uh, a complex of eight histone proteins with DNA wrapped around it. And so the important point about nucleosomes here in this lecture anyways is that the tails, the N and C terminals of those histone proteins are generally accessible and therefore they can be heavily modified um, through post-translational modifications. And so here in part A of the diagram, I'm just showing you uh, three different nucleosomes and the little squiggly lines correspond to the N and C terminals uh, coming out of those histone proteins. And part B of this diagram basically show you a top-down view um, of these uh, nucleosomes and it shows you basically different N and C terminals coming out of the different histone proteins. And what all the different circles represent are essentially different possible histone modifications uh, to the different tails on those histone proteins. And so the point of this slide is really just to show you that there's, and this isn't even all of the possible post-translational modifications, but this is just to give you an idea that there are many different possible modifications to those histone tails. And that should just give you an idea of how complex histone modifications really can be. And so it's also worth mentioning uh, something called the histone code hypothesis. And so I think when earlier on when epigenetics was, uh, when histone modifications were first being studied, it wasn't really clear whether histone modifications were playing a direct role in changing gene regulation or whether they were simply there to um, change how often nucleosomes formed or were stably bound um, to DNA at particular locations. And so the histone code hypothesis basically just um, hypothesizes that histone modifications are actually an active part of the gene regulation system and different, uh, different modifications are actually actively recognized by certain regulators, uh, which then go and change their behavior based on those histone modifications. And so the histone mod code hypothesis just basically postulates that um, histone modifications are, are really an active part of the system and not just sort of like a passive uh, mechanism by which you can change accessibility of DNA. And so because there's so many different types of histone tail modifications, people have devised essentially a, a systematic way of naming uh, histone modifications so that it's easy to tell, it's easy to communicate which modifications you're talking about. And so generally speaking, there's uh, three to four parts of a histone modification uh, name. And so here I'm giving you an example of uh, one particular modification called H3K4ME3. And so what the first part of the name H3 stands for is basically just telling you which, uh, which of the histone proteins in the nucleosome is being modified. Uh, K4, which is the second part of the name, tells you which amino acid uh, is being modified. So in this case, it's the fourth lysine. Uh, the ME and the last part of the name basically tells you what the chemical modification is. So ME stands for methylation, AC stands for acetylation, and UB stands for ubiquitination. Um, the three in this case just tells you that uh, there's three methyl groups being added here. Um, obviously with acetylation, you can only have one acetyl group. And so there's no number if you have an as a modification that involves an acetylation. But in this case, you have trimethylation, which means you, you have three methyl groups being added to the, to the amino acid. So the purpose of this slide is to illustrate the relationship between some of the better characterized epigenetic marks, chromatin accessibility and transcriptional regulation. And so part A of this diagram really tries to illustrate that chromatin accessibility and nucleosome positioning really play a really critical role and really act as gatekeepers for transcription factor binding and enhancer activity in general. So basically the idea is that densely populated nucleosomes uh, and basically inaccessible regions of the genome basically lead to a decrease in transcription factor binding both for active activators and repressors, uh, RNA pull 2 and other proteins. On the other hand, when you have accessible regions of the genome, so accessible by accessible, I mean they're nucleosome free, uh, those regions of the genome are generally available to be bound by TFs or RNA pull 2 or so on. And so when those regions are open, basically the set of proteins uh, and factors that bind to that region basically define the identity and the, the function of, of that region. So for example, when you have 
transcription factors that activate genes binding to a region, then that region is considered an active enhancer. Uh, similarly, if you have repressors binding to a region, then it's, you know, that region is generally considered a repressive element. Um, the important point to make here is that nucleosome positioning is highly dynamic. And so transitioning between open-in and closed chromatin and vice versa typically happens through the action of chromatin remodelers uh, and transcription factors. And so, for example, pioneer transcription factors are defined as transcription factors that kind of go in and make the initial binding and open up the chromatin for other factors, which make it available for other factors to come in and bind. And so you'll notice that in most of this lecture, most of the histone modifications we uh, discuss are on the H3 histone. And so oftentimes when I talk about uh, histone modifications, I'll actually just drop the H3 just because the names get pretty long. Um, so part B basically illustrates that active enhancers are generally marked by K4 monomethylation as well as K27 acetylation. Um, yeah, those, those regions are generally uh, associated with activating transcription factors binding to them. On the other hand, you also have active promoters, and those are typically defined by uh, histone marks like K4 trimethylation and K27 acetylation. And so in, one of the key differences between active promoters and enhancers is that obviously at promoter sites, you have pull 2 binding to them as well. What's kind of also interesting to note is that in, across the genome, uh, you have different classes of enhancers. And so enhancers marked by K27 acetylation, for example, are generally some of the strongest uh, enhancers that you can see on a genome. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can have enhancers that are marked with just K4 monomethylation. And so those are generally considered weak enhancers in that they are associated with uh, lower levels of activation than those enhancers uh, marked by K27 acetylation. Uh, they're also called primed enhancers in the sense that um, they're easy to, or not easy, but they're they're more, it's easier to quickly activate those enhancers because all you need to do to turn a primed enhancer to an active enhancer is just add some K27 acetylation. Uh, that's in contrast to what are known as poised enhancers. So poised enhancers uh, generally are for, refer to uh, open regions of the genome uh, or nucleosome-free regions of the genome that are marked by K4 monomethylation, but that are also marked by K27 trimethylation. So K27 trimethylation is generally associated with uh, polycomb repressive marks. And so uh, polycomb complexes are, are basically just protein complexes that are generally responsible for epigenetic si silencing of genes. Uh, they also play some roles in, in processes like X chromosome inactivation. Uh, but generally, uh, polycomb repressive marks are associated with uh, basically repressed expression. And so these are poison enhancers because there's, they're nucleosome-free, or generally nucleosome-free, uh, but they also are repressed. <clears throat> and so there's no active enhancing going on at, that, um, at those particular loci. In order for those loci to turn active, you have to remove the polycomb mark and add on K27 acetylation. Uh, it's worth noting that poised enhancers, for whatever reason, seem to segregate close to developmental genes, um, whereas primed enhancers can be found all over the genome. Uh, it, it's important to note, I, I'm not sure why, but uh, part D of this diagram also seems, to indicate, also seems to suggest that poised enhancers are closed. Uh, that's not actually the case. Poised enhancers are uh, tend to be nucleosome-free regions that just have the polycomb repressive mark. Um, I think it's. I think you see a lot of nucleosomes there, just because uh, that part of the figure also just illustrates that closed uh, or inacces inaccessible regions of the genome also tend to be associated with polycomb repressive marks. And so this slide is also just to kind of give a brief summary of some of the better characterized epigenetic marks and what kinds of elements uh, they tend to be associated with. Um, and so some of the ones that I haven't talked about yet are uh, marks associated with active transcription, uh, like K36 trimethylation, uh, K79 dimethylation, and K20 monomethylation. Um, something we'll talk about in a few slides is what I've labeled here as DNAs, or basically assays for measuring chromatin accessibility. Uh, but generally speaking, accessible chromatin is generally associated with 
things like enhancers or promoters or active transcription. So now we'll say a few brief words about assays that we use to actually uh, identify the locations of histone modifications across the genome. And so historically, one of the most popular assays for identifying histone modification locations is ChIP-seq. So this slide basically just shows you ChIP-seq as we talked about it before. Uh, the only difference is that uh, basically there's been antibodies developed for different histone modifications uh, on different histone proteins. And so we can just use the standard ChIP-seq protocol to identify uh, fragments of the genome that are close to histones with particular uh, modifications on them. So cut and run is a relatively new technique, uh, first developed in 2017, that will hopefully replace ChIP-seq as the go-to assay for antibody-based sequencing. There's two key components of cut and run. First, you need an antibody for your target of interest, just like for ChIP-seq. And second, you need a fusion protein that consists of protein A, which is a protein that binds most antibodies strongly, and MNAs, which is a non-specific endo and exonuclease. And so the idea is that your cells get harvested, but they're not fixed with, for example, formaldehyde like they are for ChIP-seq. And then you bind them to some magnetic beads, uh, which are attached to some solid support. You then make the cell membranes permeable, which allows your antibody to diffuse in and find its target. And it also allows you then to diffuse in your fusion protein. And so because protein A binds strongly to antibodies, the protein A then helps localize the nucleus close to where the antibody target is, and ultimately leads to uh, the nucleus making cuts on either side of the target. And so since we didn't cross-link the nuclei, then the cleave fragments that are released with the two cuts made by the nucleus then diffuse out of the nuclei uh, and get sequenced at the end of the protocol. So overall, cut and run has a much higher signal to noise ratio than ChIP-seq. You generally get higher resolution than ChIP-seq in the sense that the fragments that you sequence uh, surrounds the actual binding site of transcription factors in the case of TF-ChIP-seq, for example, uh, more closely than in classic ChIP-seq. And you get this resolution at around 15% of the read depth of ChIP-seq. And so you basically get more for less reads. Um, because the nuclei are not cross-linked, that basically means that only the targeted cut fragments diffuse out of the cell at the end of the protocol. And so the fragments you sequence are more from are much more likely to be from the foreground than in the background. So cut and run basically has a little background noise which comes from reads from unbound DNA. And actually newer versions of the cut and run protocol don't even need you to isolate nuclei in the first place. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, cut and run currently only requires around 100 cells if you're trying to assay histone modifications and around 1,000 cells for transcription factors, uh, which is obviously much better than classic ChIP-seq where you might need up to like millions of cells for input. Uh, 